thank you for the invitation to come and speak. Um, we had a little bit of technical difficulties there, but I think we got past them. Uh, I appreciate the chance to speak with uh, you in South Korea. It would have been nice to have been there with you in person, but we have to do lots of things virtual these days. I will be talking about some of the standardization challenges and the efforts that we've been making at NIST. My name is Dustin Moody, and I'm the lead of our post-quantum cryptography project at NIST, representing our, our team there. So NIST is a agency that's a part of the United States government. Um, we have a long history. It goes all the way back to our constitution of the United States, where it said Congress would have the power to create standard weights and measures. So NIST is a part of the government that creates standards for different things. Um, our group specifically works on standards for cryptography. We're headquartered in Gaithersburg, Maryland. It's just outside of Washington, DC. And we have a large number of researchers and scientists that work for us in a variety of different scientific endeavors. We've had uh, five Nobel Prizes awarded to our, our scientists. So as I said, the part of NIST that I work on uh, deals with cryptography and standards for cryptography. And we develop these standards through a variety of different ways. Um, these are all summarized at the bottom. There's a, a report that's called NISTER 7977. Um, this, is, this slide is a summary of that report that talks about the different ways that we create the standards at NIST in cryptography. One of the ways we do this is through international competitions. Uh, NIST has had great success in doing this in the past. For example, we did a, a competition that resulted in AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard, that's the most widely used block cipher in the world today. More recently, we, we had the SHA-3 competition where we selected a new hash function known as SHA-3. And currently right now, we are running two projects, one of them the post-quantum and the other one, the lightweight crypto competition, um, both going on, going on right now. And I'll of course talk more about the post-quantum project. There are other ways that we can develop standards. Sometimes we will collaborate with other standards organizations. These could be industry standard groups. They could be international standards organizations. Um, for example, RSA is an algorithm that we standardized, but it was first standardized through industry. Um, and there are other examples of that. Sometimes NIST will also do an open call for proposals where we have an open invitation for researchers to send us cryptographic techniques. So this is one, uh, one way we have done with our modes of operation for the AES block cipher. And finally, if we can't come up with a standard through any other way, then we can create our own standard using our in-house technical expertise. We, we like to do any of the other options, but that's something we can always do is create our own standard, uh, create the algorithm ourselves. In creating these standards, the principles that we always want to follow are transparency, openness, balance, integrity, technical merit, we want people to trust the cryptography that we standardize at NIST. Um, and they know that it is very strong cryptography, that you can have confidence in the technical merit, and that it can be widely used and adopted around the world. So it's very important how we develop our standards so that you can trust the process and you can trust the standards that come out of NIST as well. Here is a slide that shows some of the different crypto standards that we have at NIST. Um, there are a variety of them. We've standardized block ciphers like AES, uh, modes of operation, hash functions like SHA-2 and SHA-3. Um, we've standardized MAX. And we've also standardized other public key algorithms such as public key digital signatures, a public key key agreement, uh, we've also got standards on random bit generation. Um, 
So a variety of different things. Of course, the reason we're talking about this today is because of the quantum threat that exists, that if we were able to have a large scale quantum computer built, then it would threaten the public key crypto systems that we use in the world today. Specifically, this involves three different standards that we have at NIST. Um, two of them, 856A and 56B, are for public key encryption or key exchange. Uh, you can think RSA, Diffie-Hellman, those type of algorithms. We also have a digital signature standard, FIPS 186, that would be threatened by Shor's algorithm. Um, and all of these algorithms, RSA, ECDSA, Diffie-Hellman, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, they would be completely broken with Shor's algorithm. So we need to replace these algorithms. Some of our other crypto standards that we have would be impacted, but we wouldn't have to replace the algorithm. For example, Grover's algorithm would be able to be run on a quantum computer. And it would give us a polynomial speed up in regards to a brute force search on the AES key. But we also know that because it's a polynomial speed up, we can just use a longer key length in AES and still provide enough security. So for example, we would, we would need to uh, at most double the key length and we would still provide enough security to use today. So that's an easier change to deal with. It's the public key crypto systems where we have to come up with new algorithms. Um, and that's the focus of our project at NIST. So the name of this field is often referred to as post-quantum cryptography or quantum safe cryptography or quantum resistant cryptography. And what we're trying to do is make sure we have safe crypto that will be protected from attacks from quantum computers and our current computers are classical computers that we have today. And we want these crypto systems to run on our classical computers that we have, because that's what we're going to be using for the next several decades. Even when quantum computers come online, they're going to be very expensive and not very common. So we need crypto that will still be deployed on our, our classical architectures. Now, we don't yet have a large scale quantum computer. So we might ask, why are we worried about this now? Why don't we simply wait until there's a quantum computer to deal with this problem? And the answer is that we, you, you could be under threat now, even though a quantum computer has not been built. Uh, there's a nice little theorem here from Dr. Michele Mosca, an expert in the field that helps us understand this. It's sometimes called a harvest now, decrypt later threat because you can have your data that you want to be protected and you can encrypt it. And an attacker could simply copy that data um, and hold on to it. They can't read it because it's encrypted, but if they wait until a quantum computer comes out, then they could get access to that data if it was protected with uh, crypto that would be broken. So if X, so uh, his theorem summarizes this, in terms of if X is how long you need to protect your information and Y is how long it's going to take until we can standardize post-quantum algorithms and get them widely adopted. If Z is how long till a quantum computer comes out, well, if X plus Y is greater than Z, then you're, you have a risk already. You have a threat already. Um, because you have to wait the Y years to use post-quantum crypto and then you will not be providing the X years of protection that you hope to. So what are X and Y and Z will depend on the different organizations. It will depend on who you are. Um, if X is looking for uh, you know, nation level secrets, X could be 30 years or longer. What is Y? Um, at NIST, we have seen crypto transitions before, and we know that they're never quite as quick as we would like, transitioning from one cryptographic algorithm to another. Uh, realistically, why will take at least 10 years, more likely 15, 20 years, for major adoption of new algorithms? And we want to do everything we can to speed that up, 
but we also have to make sure we, we do it the right way. So then the big question is, what is Z? How long until we have a quantum computer out there that could threaten the public key cryptography that we have today? Well, nobody knows for certain. It's a research question. But there was a survey done where they asked 44 experts around the world their opinion on this question. And I'd refer you to the full report. There's a link down there. It's due to Dr. Michele Mosca and his colleague, Dr. Piani. But this is the chart that summarizes the main findings. You can see in the top row, uh, when they were asked, is it likely we will have a, such a quantum computer in five years? Most of the experts thought it was a very low probability event, less than 1%, less than 5%. If we look at 10 years, we start to see a change that starts to be um, increasingly more likely according to these experts. Um, and if you go to 15 years, well then there's, I think 37 of the experts predicted that there's at least a 30% chance we would have a quantum computer in 15 years. So there's lots of uncertainty in this, but these experts are predicting that it's, it's possible to have such a quantum computer in 10 to 15 years. And so that's what Z could be. Now, I want to be clear, um, when we mention quantum and cryptography, there's another um, field that is, is related, but it's different than what I'm talking about today. And it goes by the name of quantum cryptography or also QKD, quantum key distribution. And that's different than post-quantum cryptography. QKD or quantum cryptography is using quantum technologies to build crypto systems that you need these special hardware to implement. Interesting property is that you can have security guaranteed by the laws of physics. Um, there are some limitations that they're still working on overcoming. And this is a very important application for, for certain high secure needs, but this is not the focus of our NIST post-quantum cryptography effort. Um, so that's a, this is a separate topic and just wanted to make sure that's understood. So NIST has had a project dealing with post-quantum cryptography for over 10 years. It was about five years ago that we started to take some more concrete steps towards standardization. We held a workshop in 2015, and in 2016, um, we published NISTER 8105, which was a short report explaining our view of post-quantum cryptography and outlining our initial steps that we would take towards standardization. In 2016, we also announced that we would be doing basically a, this worldwide competition-like process that we're currently involved in. So we made sure that researchers and people around the world knew this process was going to start. And they had about a year to design algorithms that they would submit to our process. Overall, we received 82 algorithms that were sent in to us of which 69 of them met all of the submission requirements that we had published. So these 69 algorithms, we published their specifications on our website, including the code, so that people could download and implement the code. And then we started evaluating them. We evaluated them internally at NIST, and we invited experts in the cryptographic community and industry around the world to also evaluate these algorithms. So we proceeded through a number of rounds. In the first round, we looked at all the candidates. Uh, at the end of the first round, we picked the ones that were most promising to move on to the second round for another round of analysis and evaluation. Uh, the second round went for about a year and a half, where we again then selected the most promising algorithms. We selected 15 to move on into the third round. And the third round is where we are now. We're getting near to the end of the third round. Um, so I'll talk in more detail about this, but this is kind of the overall timeline of where the project has been in the past several years. Now in considering standardizing post-quantum cryptography, um, we, we have discovered there are many, many complexities, um, much more challenging than some of our standardization projects we've done in the past. For example, in comparing it to the SHA-3 hash function, 
a post quantum crypto is is way more complex. For one thing, we are looking for multiple primitives. We're looking for digital signatures as well as um, public key encryption or key establishment at the same time. We're also needing to guarantee security against both classical and quantum attacks, which is an avenue of attacks we haven't had to consider in the past. There's a lot of theoretical aspects to this. There's a lot of practical aspects to measuring security. We don't have all the answers to these. Um, there's lots of trade-offs that are going to be involved. It was clear very early on that there was not any one post-quantum algorithm that would be an easy drop-in replacement to our current crypto that we use today. So there would have to be some trade-offs in regards to either security or performance or some other factors. We also knew that um, key sizes were going to most likely be larger than what we use with RSA or with elliptic curve crypto. So that could pose a challenge when we need to migrate to these algorithms and put them into new app, existing and new applications. Can they handle that larger key sizes? So even though this was, uh, we call it a competition, um, it is and it isn't. It's very similar to our competitions, but we, we will also have more than one algorithm that we standardize at the end of this process. The criteria that we announced that we would use to evaluate the algorithms are given here. Number one is security. Of course, if we want to uh, protect our information and our data, security is the most important feature. So the submissions needed to be protected both from classical and quantum attacks. Then we would look at performance. Performance would be measured on a variety of platforms. Uh, both high-end and low-end in software and in hardware. We would be looking at the key size, the ciphertext size, the signature size, how much memory does it take, how efficient is it? So all those sorts of benchmarks. And then besides those two main, two main criteria, we listed a number of other properties that we thought it would be desirable to have. Uh, we didn't expect an algorithm would have necessarily all of these, but we wanted them to have as many as possible. Things like they can provide perfect forward secrecy, or they provide resistance to side channel attacks, or they're simple, or they're flexible, uh, things like that. So in looking a little more at our security criteria, we defined some security models so that submitters would know what was considered a valid attack. So for signatures, we looked at the model of existentially enforgeable with respect to adaptive chosen message attacks. In the literature, that's often referred to as EUF-CMA. For CHEMS and encryptions, we, we wanted it to be semantically secure with respect to adaptive chosen ciphertext attacks or INDCCA2. And with these models, uh, researchers knew how to design systems so that they could give us security proofs to help convince us of the security. In measuring quantum security, um, there was not a, a universally accepted way when we started this process as to how, the, how to do that. Even now, I don't think there's a consensus in the cryptographic community um, of one precise easy way to measure how much quantum security is being provided. So it's a little bit, we have to be measuring, uh, comparing apples and oranges. Um, these algorithms are, are based on different mathematical primitives. So it makes them very hard to compare. Ultimately, what we decided was to relate the security back to the security levels that we already had for our algorithms standardized at NIST. So like right now for RSA, we give parameter sizes that provide you with 112 bits or 128 bits or 256 bits. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty in this still. There's the possibility that new quantum algorithms will be discovered. There's also the fact that quantum computers have not yet been built. We don't know how fast they will be. We don't know how much memory they'll have, how efficient they will be. So it's hard to say you're protecting against an attack from a quantum computer when you don't know how uh, fast that will be. 
So there's a lot of questions with security there. Uh, ultimately, we defined five security categories so that when submitters gave us parameter sets, they could tell us which security level they were in. And we related this to our, our crypto that's standardized at NIST. So for example, for an algorithm to provide, uh, to be in security category one, it has to be at least as hard to break that algorithm as it is to break AES-128 doing an exhaustive key search. And you'd have to measure these resources using a variety of different metrics. Um, so it, it's kind of a, a difficult definition that we gave, but it was the best we could come up with. So you can measure these resources. You could do things like count the number of classical elementary operations. Um, that's what we do for our classical crypto algorithms. You could look at the quantum circuit size. You could look at the circuit depth and put bounds on it. Uh, you'd also look at uh, quantum and classical gates um, and looking at the cost of that. We think levels one, two, and three will provide enough security for the next several decades, but we also wanted parameter sets for levels four and five for applications that need uh, a lot of security. Again, there was many challenges as we started working through this process. Some of them we knew that we would have to encounter. Some of them arose as uh, we, we worked through the process. A lot of these post-quantum schemes are relatively new. Uh, post-quantum cryptography is an active research area. And we understand that it takes time to have confidence in the security. And besides quantum security, we need to understand their classical security. For many of these algorithms, the best known attacks are classical algorithms. So that's uh, something that we need researchers to look at. There were also situations which uh, we haven't had to deal with before. Some of these post-quantum algorithms have decryption failure. That means even if you do everything right, you encrypt following the specification and then decrypt there's a small probability that your message will not decrypt correctly. Will that be a problem in protocols? Um, that's something that had to be looked at. There were also issues in terms of, we very much were hoping for a, an exact replacement for the Diffie-Hellman algorithm because the Diffie-Hellman is so widely used today. Well, it turns out there's, there's no great post-quantum algorithm that is exactly like the Diffie-Hellman. So we had to modify what we were looking for and look at public key encryption and key encapsulation mechanisms that can provide that same functionality in, in a slightly different way. Um, there's, there's issues with some of these algorithms using static keys, which is different. Uh, in general, just the submissions were more complicated technically than some of the crypto systems that we're used to, like RSA. In looking at cost and performance, um, we wanted to measure this in classical platforms because that's where these algorithms will be most widely implemented. Um, there are a lot of different applications. There are a lot of different targets, a lot of different platforms where you run these applications. So we understand that some algorithms may be better suited for some applications than others. Uh, and that led us to conclude early on that we would need to standardize more than one algorithm to accommodate different applications. For example, you may have a great algorithm, but it has a very large public key size and a very small ciphertext size. That performance profile might work for some applications, but in other applications where you need to transmit that public key, a large public key is a problem. So there might be a better post-quantum algorithm that is tailored for that. So when looking at the submissions that came in, um, this was very much a worldwide effort. There was uh, several hundred researchers that were involved on the submission teams and they came from all six continents. They came from 25 different countries around the world. Uh, there were several South Korean researchers who were involved with the process. Um, so that was good to see. And I'll talk briefly about the first round. 
So in the first round, there's a table in the bottom right of the slide that shows the types of crypto systems that we received. You can see that the majority were based on lattices and based on codes. And most of those were dealing with, they were uh, either CHEMS or encryption algorithms. Uh, we also had a lot of multivariate signature schemes. Uh, we had a couple stateless hash or symmetric based algorithms. And in the first round, we had seven algorithms that were kind of based on different ideas from the, the main families that have been kind of traditionally studied over the last decade or two in the field of post-quantum cryptography. So we noticed there was a lot of similarity, particularly in the lattice chem category. Uh, a lot of these were using a very similar idea. So we encouraged some of them to merge. Cryptographers quickly got to work though, and they broke a lot of these schemes. I'd say about 15 to 20 schemes were broken in the first round. We also held a workshop where each submission team was invited to come and present their algorithm. And that was a, held jointly with the PQ Crypto Workshop in Florida and had a very large attendance. It was a very nice workshop. We created an online forum called the PQC Forum where people could ask questions, people could present research results, people could make official comments about the algorithms. Uh, we use it to make announcements. And so that's been a very, a very good channel to communicate with the community and for them to communicate with us. Uh, the PQC forum has had some difficulties uh, because there are some, uh, we don't control the messages that everyone gives. So sometimes there are people involved who, uh, have been quite strong in what they've written. And so that, that has been a challenge to make sure the PQC forum is a polite professional environment where everyone can um, share what they want to about these issues. Um, in the first round, we started to see the, the beginning uh, research on these candidates and the first preliminary performance numbers. So we evaluated all of this for about a year and uh, we listened to what the experts around the world were also saying. And we selected 26 schemes to move on into the second round. So as you can see in the second round, that table at the bottom right, we largely kept the same algorithm diversity. We just had to reduce down the numbers. So some submissions merged together, that was good. Um, but we kept a lot of lattice-based schemes, a lot of code-based schemes, um, several multivariate signatures, uh, and so forth. There were some hard decisions when we had to make those cuts, um, but we needed to get a smaller number for people to focus on. Even though we'd selected what we thought were the most promising algorithms, uh, crypto, crypto experts were still able to break seven of these algorithms during the second round, um, either break or significantly attack. We again held another workshop. This time it was co-located with Crypto in California. And again, there was a lot more research, a lot more benchmarking. We started to see some real world experiments where people were testing and implementing these algorithms and protocols. And after 18 months, we again had to make some hard decisions and select 15 submissions to move on into the third round. So that brings us to where we are. We're in the third round. And we did something a little bit different in the third round. Um, we divided the algorithms into two different classifications. The first we called finalists. These were the algorithms that we thought would be ready for standardization at the end of the third round and could be widely used by most applications. There were a number of other algorithms that we were still interested in but we thought that they would either need more time for standardization or that they could wait a little while longer until we would standardize them. So we called these other algorithms alternates because we really wanted to focus people's attention on the finalists so that at the end of the third round, we would be confident in the algorithms that we would select. So the finalists for CHEMS include Kyber, Entru, Saber, and Classic McLeese. Uh, Kyber, Entru, and Saber are all based on lattices. Classic McLeese is based on codes. And for our signature finalists, we had Dilithium and Falcon, both based on lattices. 
and then rainbow, which is a multivariate signature scheme. And then the other alternates that we had are, are listed there. Um, to briefly summarize the, the finalists and the alternates, uh, these are the five lattice-based chems that advanced on. Kyber, Saber, and Entru were our three finalists. All three are based on structured lattices. As such, they have good balance between public key size and Cypertech size. Uh, they're also very efficient to implement in practice. Um, efficiency should not be too much of a concern. So we see these three algor algorithms as good all around selections. And we expect to choose one of them for standardization at the end of the third round because they are similar. We don't need all three, we'll, we'll just need one of them. Entru Prime was selected as an alternate. It, it had some different design choices. Um, so it's possible if there were some attacks against Kyber, Saber, or Entru, they might not apply to Entru Prime. Protochem did not use structured lattices. They did a security performance trade-off. Um, it makes their key sizes and their um, ciphertech sizes larger, but it, it also closed an avenue of attack by not using structured lattices. So Frodo might be seen as more conservative, but it's also a little bit bigger and slower than the other lattice schemes. If we look at the remaining chems that were selected, Classic McLeese was a finalist. It's based on codes. It's been around a long time, since 1979, so we have good confidence in its security. Um, its performance profile is not quite as balanced. It has very large public keys on the order of megabytes, but its ciphertexts are the smallest out of all the algorithms. And then we have Bike and HQC. These are two code-based alternates. Both introduce some structure into the codes to try and get smaller key sizes than classic McLeese. And they, they're successful at that. Their key sizes are much smaller. Um, they're a little bit bigger than the lattices. They're pretty efficient in practice. We think one of them will make a, a good algorithm to be standardized, most likely after the fourth round. And then there is one more algorithm, Psych, that's based on isogenies of elliptic curves. Um, it has the smallest key sizes around out of all the algorithms, but it's also slower than all the other algorithms. So here's a little chart here that helps to picture the, the key size, the public key size and the ciphertext size of the chems, um, the ones at category one. So notice that the axes have logarithmic scale. They're measuring the byte size and you want a small public key, you want a small ciphertext. So you can see that orange dot representing isogenies or psych has the smallest key sizes. Then in blue, we have the lattice schemes. Then in gray, the code base schemes. And then that blue dot at the top is Frodo and the gray dot at the far right is classic police. If we look at performance uh, in terms of how efficient they are in software, these are some benchmarks taken on a Haswell AVX2 Intel processor. Um, and this is just to give you a rough idea of kind of the performance if you're looking at key gen, encapsulation, and decapsulation. Again, notice the axis is on a logarithmic scale. You can see that the lattice space schemes, a Kyber entry, Saber entry prime, tend to be the most efficient overall. If we look at the signatures, uh, we have dilithium and falcon. Similar to the lattice based chems, they're very balanced, very efficient. Uh, we think they're good algorithms, and we expect to select one for standardization at the end of the third round. For Sphinx Plus and Picnic, they're based on symmetric key primitives. Um, Sphinx Plus, in particular, is based on the security of hash functions, and that's very well understood. It's a little bit bigger and slower. So that's its drawback. Uh, Rainbow and Gems are both multivariate signature schemes. Um, their performance profile is similar to Classic McLeese in that they have large public keys, but have small signatures. Um, and you can verify very fast for both. 
Uh, we thought Rainbow was a little bit better, so it was selected as a finalist while Gems was an alternate. However, during the third round, there have been uh, research that has presented attacks on both Rainbow and Gems, and that calls into question their security a little bit. So some charts for the signatures. You can see here that the key sizes and the signature sizes are very much determined by the type of algorithm that you are. The symmetric have small public key, large signatures. The multivariate have huge public key, but very tiny signatures. And the lattices are, are more balanced with public keys and signatures, both around um, 1,000 bytes or so at category one. If we look at performance, here you can see that uh, it depends if you're looking at key gen, signing, or verify. Uh, Picnic has a very fast key gen. Um, if you look at dilithium, it looks overall, it's pretty balanced and pretty efficient. And you can see the different comparisons with the other signature algorithms there. So there are still many open questions that we do not know the answers to. We're getting near towards the end of the third round and we're going to have to make our selections. Um, so it'd be nice to know the answers, but we don't live in a perfect world where we always know everything we wish to. Um, there are a lot of security proofs given in both the random Oracle model and the quantum random Oracle model. Some of the details are missing or still need to be worked out. There's a lot of uh, questions about specific choices that the candidates made. And I won't go into the exact details, but um, a lot of research still to be done and that people are still actively looking at. And we're not sure on some of the choices they made, do they matter? If you introduce this type of structure or use this type of ring, will that lead to an attack in the future? We don't know. So the timeline, um, just to remind you of that, the third round will end roughly at the end of this year or the beginning of early next year. Uh, it's looking more likely it will be early next year. At which point we will announce the algorithms, the finalist algorithms that we plan on standardizing. Um, besides the finalist algorithms, it is also possible that we standardize Sphinx Plus. Um, and I'll talk about that on the next slide. We'll also issue a report to explain our decisions. We've done that at the end of each round so that uh, the public and the crypto community can understand why we selected the algorithms we did. We will also announce any candidates that are moving on for a fourth round of study. Uh, these would be coming from the alternates. The fourth round will be similar to what we've done. It'll be 12 to 18 months and will consist of looking at research, benchmarks, and so on and so forth. It'll probably take us a year or two to work with the submission teams to write a, a standard. We'll put a draft standard out for public comment to get public feedback. We'll consider the suggestions made. And we hope by 2024, uh, the first set of standards will be finalized and published and be all ready for use. Now, in looking at the signatures, if you recall, we only had six signatures that are still under consideration in our third round. And two of them had attacks in the third round. So there's a small number of signatures that might be ready for standardization. Um, that's one reason why we might consider standardizing Sphinx Plus at the end of the third round, because we're very confident in its security. Um, and we would standardize that in addition to one of the lattice-based algorithms. We think it's important to have more than one algorithm so that if there's some new attack discovered on lattices, we would have another algorithm that could be used and would be ready. So it's important for security to have a diversity of the type of cryptographic algorithm. But Sphinx Plus is also a little bit bigger and slower than what we would like to use in protocols today. So at the end of the third round, we are also going to issue a new call for signatures. Our main target is to find a general purpose digital signature scheme, which is efficient, which can be used by most applications, which is not based on structured lattices. 
because we already have some good algorithms that are based on structured lattices. So this will start a, a new process. Um, it will be much smaller in scope. We want to get just a few different algorithms, um, signature algorithms. We don't want anywhere near you know, 70, 80 algorithms submitted to us. And it's to diversify our signature for portfolio. Obviously, the more mature that the scheme is, the better. Um, but it will probably take some time once these signatures are sent in. Uh, they'll have to go through a number of rounds until we can be confident that they could be selected for standardization. So if the algorithm sent in, we will take a look and decide if there are any of them that we want to focus attention on. Now, how does NIST make its decisions as we're getting near to the end of the third round? Well, we will use the evaluation criteria that I've already talked about, um, security performance and various algorithm and implementation characteristics. Uh, for each of those security and performance, there are several smaller subcategories that you can examine and compare the algorithms in. For lattice chems, again, the main decision will be Kyber, Entru, or Sabre. Uh, we expect that one of those algorithms that we select will be the widely used chem um, that people start using in the future. And similarly for dilithium and falcon um, for signatures. Each of the other algorithms uh, will be a choice where uh, they're not being compared quite as much in comparison to the other. For example, if we want to standardize classic MacLeese, that'll be its own decision. It's not really competing against Kyber, Entru, and Sabre because it has a different performance profile. So NIST is taking inputs, of course. Um, each of the submission teams was allowed to make tweaks at the end of each round. We've looked at official comments that were made online in our PQC forum. We've looked at research papers that have been published in journals and presented at workshops. Uh, we have listened to our stakeholders. Uh, this includes our, our national security agency and industry and many other groups and organizations. Even though we receive all this input, I still want to be clear that NIST alone is the one making these decisions um, based on the publicly available information. And we stand by the decisions that we make and we will issue a report to explain them. One of the factors that's proving to be a challenge is related to patent and intellectual property issues. And this is a very complicated area Nobody on our team at NIST is experts in patents, um, but I think we all know that patents can play a, a very important role in impacting if cryptographic algorithms will be adopted. So each of the submitters was required to list any patents that they had, but it turns out that there are some patents that are owned by third parties, um, so not belonging to the submitters, that potentially may impact some of the algorithms we are considering for standardization. Um, so that's obviously a very important issue because we want the algorithms we select to be widely used and adopted. And we know that if there's a patent, that makes that less likely. So we are actively working to resolve these known patent issues. Um, when we have something concrete to say, we will share that. But we want to be clear as well that it might not be possible for us to resolve all the IP concerns. When you're working with another party, you can't control what the other party will, will do. So NIST would very much like feedback on this, on the impact of intellectual property on adoption, as well as how NIST should factor these considerations into our process. Now, besides our process, um, there have been some post-quantum algorithms that have been standardized already. These are called stateful hash-based signatures, and the theory of them has been around since the 1970s, and in the past few years, they have been standardized by the IETF, um, the algorithms XMSS and LMS, and shortly after, NIST also standardized those same two algorithms um, in SP800-208. ISO is also looking at these as well. While these algorithms do provide protection from quantum attacks, 
they are not general purpose algorithms for digital signatures. And that's because you have to carefully manage the state of the algorithms. And if you make any small mistakes, you completely leak your secret key and you lose all security. So all of these documents have warnings that these are they should not be used in too many places. And we, we recommend only certain applications um, that should use these. Uh, applications like code signing. And looking ahead to the transition to post-quantum algorithms, one thing that's being considered a lot is a hybrid mode. That's where you combine a classical cryptographic algorithm with a post-quantum cryptographic algorithm in some way. And then in order to break that hybrid mode, you would have to break both the classical and the post-quantum algorithm. Um, NIST hasn't really specified how to do that. Right now, we're mostly leaving that up to applications and protocols to decide, to decide how to combine those two algorithms if they want to. Uh, in one of our standards, we did illustrate one way you can do that um, and that you could still get FIPS validation to show that that's possible. Now, the transition to these algorithms will be very important. Um, and NIST is actively working on trying to get people forward looking into this as well. Uh, we've published crypto guidance in the past for things like triple, triple, triple DES um, and SHA-1. Uh, when it was time to migrate, we gave guidance. And we will provide similar guidance um, once we have post-quantum algorithms to transition to. Our National Cybersecurity of Excellence, the NCCOE, has a project that is more focused directly on the migration aspect of this. And they've partnered with our the United States Department of Homeland Security to do this. So you can go to their website and you can see their more details about their project, but it has white papers and reports that help organizations understand what's involved with this transition and to help them prepare for the transition to um, coming up. If you're interested in getting involved with that project, um, you can email them or contact them. They're actively looking for people to collaborate with them on this project. There are other standards organizations around the world, of course, that are working on post-quantum cryptography. I've listed several of them here. Um, IETF does several internet protocols. Um, they are mostly waiting to see what comes out of the NIST process. ETSI is a European standards group that we are uh, collaborating with and cooperating very nicely with. Um, the EU has had other groups that have made recommendations. ISO is working on quantum resistant crypto. And of course, other countries have begun standardization activities as well, like you're doing in South Korea. Um, China has had an effort to standardize their own algorithms. I've heard a little bit about Russia um, doing their own process as well. So NIST is interacting and collaborating with as many of these groups as possible. And it's been nice to see that there has been good cooperation so that we don't get a lot of different post-quantum standards. Uh, most organizations are waiting to see what comes out of the NIST process. So what can organizations do now to prepare? Mostly this involves taking a look at the cryptography you're using today. Find what, uh, what public key algorithms you're using and start looking at how are you going to take those algorithms out and replace them in with new algorithms. Um, make sure your vendors know about this. Uh, do they already have products with quantum safe features? Is your IT staff aware of these issues? Um, we'd encourage you to track developments in quantum computing, uh, to follow our NIST process so you know when standards are available. Basically, uh, you need to have somebody whose job it is to be on top of this, to create a plan for your organization. And the more organized and prepared you act ahead of time, uh, it will be less expensive, less disruptive, and you're less likely to have mistakes in the future. So in conclusion, we can start to see some of the light at the end of the tunnel. We are near the end of the third round. 
We will very shortly have algorithms that we will be writing standards for. NIST is very grateful for everybody's efforts around the world. We could not do this on our own. Uh, there's only 15 of us on our team. So we are very much grateful for standards organizations, for researchers, for industry who are helping to evaluate these algorithms. And of course, you can find more information on our website. If you haven't signed up for the PQC forum, I'd encourage you to do so. And you can always contact us directly as well. So with that, I'd like to say thank you again for the opportunity to speak. And I'd be happy to answer any questions if there's time for that.